And, uh, and then other than that, uh, again, Tuesday at 2 p.m. in Ringgold and Wednesday, Bible study and prayer at 7 p.m. All right, Brother Doug, read some fellowship song. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Amen. He hideth my soul, 102. 102 for our fellowship song. 102 on the first verse. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of a rock. Where cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hide in my life in the depth of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me Amen. Shake hands and fellowship. Amen. 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 I just hold I just hold the pulpit down. It holds me down. Holds me up. <laughs> He hideth my soul. Let's sing that first verse again, 102. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of
Sister Janet. <laughs> borrowed a manger of hay for his bed Jesus my Savior no soft downy pillow no warm cradle spread for Jesus my Lord his were the planets and stars in the sky his were the valleys and mountains so high his all earth's riches from pole unto pole but he became poor to ransom my soul he borrowed a room for the Passover feast. Jesus, my Savior, becoming both servant and heavenly priest. This Jesus, my Lord, his were the planets and stars in the sky his were the valleys and mountains so high his all earth's riches from pole unto pole but he became poor to ransom my soul <coughs> They borrowed a tomb for the crucified one, Jesus, my Savior. No monument royal for God's only Son, for Jesus, my Lord. His were the planets and stars in the sky his were the valleys and mountains so high his all earth's riches from pole unto pole but he became poor to ransom my soul Praise the Lord. Thank you, Miss Janet. Let's take our Bible tonight and turn to Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. Hallelujah. And we're going to look at verses 15 to 23 tonight. And uh, when you find it, you can say amen and we'll know you're there. Ephesians chapter number 1. And hallelujah. The, uh, uh, the Baptist bride folks and the, uh, and the crazy people that believe the book of Ephesians is the only book for the church will be happy tonight because we're preaching out of the book of Ephesians. <laughs> Thank God we're not one of them crazy people. We believe the whole counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation. Amen. Uh, but, but thank God. Uh, thank God for the, for the truth of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians 1 verse 15 says this. It says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, 
the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of the power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. And it put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And what I want to take our text from is verse 23, where he talks about the body of Christ and the fullness of him that filleth all in all. What I want to preach on this thought tonight, Christ is all I need. Amen. You know, if people could figure that out in their life, that all they need is Christ in their lives. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And how Christ, having him in your life, changes everything. And thank God, he's all I need. Let's pray. Father, I pray you bless the word tonight. God, you are my all. You are my everything. Without you, we are nothing. And God, as we preach on this little thought tonight, I pray that it be a blessing to the family and to the church of God and to those that are listening online and watching and that the Holy Spirit would speak to all of our hearts Lord, you are sufficiency. You're what we need. And thank God, if everyone could figure that out, their lives would be so different. And thank you, Lord, for those who have. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you preach on this little thought tonight, Christ is all I need. He's all I need. We have that song. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All I need. Boy, if everyone could get a hold of that. You know? One thing I'm glad of tonight, that Christ is everything. Amen. And when you have him, you don't need anything or anyone else. Amen. Hallelujah for that. Uh, Colossians 3 and verse 11 says that he is all in all. You're right there. Look at that. Colossians 3 and, and, and verse, uh, verse number 11. Just slide on over there a few pages. And, and notice what it says. It says, Wherefore, there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision, uncertain, barbarian, Scythian, bond, or free. But Christ is all. And in all. Think about that little statement for a minute. Uh, that's the greatness. Uh, that's one of the great mysteries of God. That he's everything. He's everything. And you've heard people say they're everything to me. Well, I tell you right now, since December 15th, 1979, God's been everything to me. <laughs> you say, what were you without Jesus? Nothing. Nothing. I had nothing without Jesus. But I'm complete in him. Amen. And that's what the Bible says. Look back. In, I should have had you stay in uh, Colossians. Look in Colossians chapter number 2. Thank God tonight I am complete in Jesus Christ. He completes me. You know, at, at our anniversary time, I always give my wife a nice card. And, and I tell her how she completes me. And she does. God says it's not good for man to be alone. Hallelujah. And, and, and marriage is such a wonderful thing when you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And, and, uh, and, and I'm so thankful, Lord, because it's a picture of what Christ does for us. Amen. That's why he said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. As a, a wife or a husband complete one another, so Jesus Christ completes us, the child of God. He's the thing, the part, piece of the puzzle that was missing my whole life. And thank God one day I got complete in Jesus Christ. Amen. And it all got put back together. Uh, Colossians 2 and verse 6 says, For which sakes... For which things sake, the wrath of God cometh on children of disobedience, in which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now uh, ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, out of your mouth, and lie not to one another. I'm not even in the right spot. Look in chapter 2. I knew I was reading something wrong. <laughs> chapter 2, verse number 6. It says, Has ye therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as we have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, be in vain to see the tradition of men after the ruin of the world, not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What it says, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You know, I love when these people say, well, you need, you need this and you need that. I don't need anything. I'm complete in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The day I got saved, he completed me. And this crowd that runs around, well, you got to have the Holy Ghost, you got to have the Holy Ghost. What are you saying? I got the Holy Ghost the day I got saved. Didn't you? Man, I'm complete in Jesus Christ. I don't need a second work of grace. The first work of grace was enough. Hallelujah. I was laughing. I talked about people talking to folks. I was talking to a guy the other day. 
and he said, you know, I, I, I got a, I, I got a holiness background, a Nazarene background, a church of God. I said, so what? I said, hallelujah. My grandmother was holiness, but she was Baptist first. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you right now, when I got, I said, I believe in the Holy Ghost. He lives inside of me. Amen. I believe in shouting and hollering and all that kind of stuff. I'm for it. Glory to God. Thank God. I wish that they had what we had. You see, I'm complete, so I'm secure in Jesus Christ. I don't get up in the morning and wonder if I committed the unpardonable sin. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> if only they could get a hold of the fact that he's forgiven us and cleansed us and made us complete. And hallelujah. There's nothing else we need because this is how it stands. I'm complete in him. My record's clean and pure and good. I'm going to heaven and nobody can take that away. Because I'm complete in him. You know, when you're, when you're complete in Jesus Christ, there is nothing like that. Nothing like that. And without Christ, people have to be honest, something's missing. Sinners go through life, what's missing? What's missing? You know? And the fullness and feeling of the Holy Ghost. The forgiveness of sin. You know? The, the feeling of satisfaction. And the sad thing is, Christians who are not walking with Jesus can't find that satisfaction either. You say, why? Because they're, they're missing the integral part. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I mean, when you got saved, you were complete in Jesus Christ. And as you walk with him... He completes you. Just like the day I got married, Miss Lisa completed me. But my walk with her the last 42 years has been, she completes me every day. And if she wasn't there, something would be missing. Right? And so the Christian who doesn't walk with Christ, something's always missing in their life. And they can't figure out, why is my life so incomplete? What's missing? It's your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. And so I'm complete in him. I'm compatible in him. You ever met people that just weren't compatible? Yeah. You ever met someone you just didn't like? Yeah. I mean, you didn't like anything about them. You don't like the way they look. You don't like the way they talk. You don't like the way they act. You just don't like them. <laughs> You're incompatible. Now, I always laugh when incompatible people marry each other. <laughs> and then they go to court and say, well, we have irreconcilable differences. No kidding. You have that the day you met each other. <laughs> <laughs> this is, is that a revelation? You didn't like each other the day you met. Why in the world did you get married? You know, you think about that, but people do stupid things, do they not? And they, and they wonder why, you know, why this thing ain't working out. And, and, and again, it's because they're, they're making a mistake there. Um, you know, and, and, and when they make those mistakes, it, it's a dreadful mistake. Uh, look in, again in, in, in Ephesians 2, look what it says there in uh, uh, notice what he said in verse number 11. Wherefore remember that in times past. Uh, I'm sorry. Being in times past Gentiles in the flesh. Who are called uncircumcision. By that which is called circumcision. The flesh made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers from the covenants of the promise. Having no hope without God in the world. And that's a sinner's lot. They're without hope. And, and, and without God. But in now in Christ Jesus you were sometimes or far off or made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. For he is our peace who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace. You say what did he do for us? Hey he made me compatible. You know I couldn't get along with God before I got saved. You say, why? Because everything in my life was wrong. But when I got forgiveness of sins, God made everything right. And the person I hated, I now love. You say, did you hate God? Well, let me tell you this. I use his name in vain every day. And I'd get mad and curse God and raise my fist and curse God. I tremble that he, I mean, how God even let me live. <laughs> but he did. <laughs> and, and I thought, Lord, uh, uh, thank you for salvation. Hallelujah. And he made me compatible, acceptable to the Father. How in the world, I mean, I mean, you, you think, would, would any of us be acceptable on our own without Jesus Christ? Uh, we just wouldn't be. Ephesians 5 and, and verse number 25. And again, he said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, and that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, why, why, when you get saved, how come God just doesn't take you to heaven? How come he just doesn't take you? 
Because he's ironing out all the wrinkles in your life. He's going to present me faultless to Jesus Christ, hallelujah. And, and what, who I am now is not who I was the day I got saved. I mean, the day I got saved, I had a lot of baggage, right? I had all them skeletons in the closet. Thank God God opened the closet and got all them skeletons out. <laughs> and he had me drop off all that baggage down at the Goodwill. <laughs> I mean, we actually had a church paper drive, and we unloaded about uh, a thousand Playboy penthouse, and we and we took it down to the paper drive in green garbage bags. I was thanking God they didn't open them. I'd have had to, I'd have hated to have to explain that. But see, we were seventeen, got saved, and I said, you know what, this stuff's got to go. One of the best decisions I ever make was get that garbage out of my life, you know. And I'd, I'd have hated to carry that to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Get that, get that alcohol out of your life. Get that, you know, that Bud Light. <laughs> get that out of your life. Uh, get that tobacco out of your life. Get all that stuff out of your life that don't belong there. Hallelujah. And you're more compatible. You know, I wasn't very compatible with the church the day I got saved. But I'm compatible now. And that's because of the work of Jesus Christ. You know, I figured some things out along the way. And thank God, he's all I need. Christ is all. He's all I need. I'm complete in him, compatible in him. Thank God I'm conformed in him. You say, what does that mean? It says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of a son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. He's conforming me to his image. You say, who do you want to be like? I don't want to be like Mike, Michael Jordan. People say, I want to be like Mike. No, I want to be like Jesus. The kids asked me the other night, what's your favorite word? And they were, they were all betting which my favorite word is. And I said, my favorite word is Jesus. Jesus. Lucy laughed. I told you his favorite word is Jesus. I said, that's right. That's my favorite word. That's who I want to be like. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be Christ-like. And I'm ashamed of my, of, my, of my condition most of the time. But I'll tell you right now, I'm more like Jesus today than I was 43 years ago when I got saved. 44 now. Thank God. I, I'm glad you can't. We, 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 there's no flashbacks. <laughs> I'm glad you can't go back to what I was the day I got saved. Man, I've come a long way in conforming myself to the image of God. And you all, people are always on a journey to do that. And we're all in different places in our journey. Some people are doing better than others. Some people have a long way to go when it, conforming themselves to the image of Christ. I don't demand that anyone be like me. But I suggest that everybody be like Jesus. Because Pilate said, I find no fault in him. You follow me around long enough, you'll know I got problems. And you know what? If I follow you long, long enough, I'll know you got problems. And some people, you don't got to follow them very long to know they got problems. <laughs> but about 15-minute conversation, you know they got a boatload of problems. But it shouldn't be that way with a seasoned child of God. Because God's conforming us to his image. Thank God he's all. He's all. Miss Universe was teaching the 23rd Psalm. Uh, to some children, she said, repeat after me, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The little boy repeated, the Lord is my shepherd, he, he, and he said, um, uh, make all that I want. <laughs> right? He, he worded that wrong. <laughs> but, but see, the Lord is all we need. Thank God the Lord's all we need. If you get Christ in your life, It'll solve every problem. You get Christ in your marriage, it'll solve every problem. You get Christ in your work atmosphere, it'll solve every problem. You get Christ in the center of everything you're doing, and guess what? Your life will be more like this. Don't you get tired of this and this and this and this and, and this and crazy stuff that's happening? You know, the more you're with Jesus, the more even kill you are with everything. That's why the Bible says we're temperate in all things. And hallelujah, when you walk with Jesus, he's all you need. He's all I need. Christ is all I need. Now, I got, I got a, a boatload of points here, but we're going to finish on time tonight because I'm, I, I'm, I, I saw all that food they had back there, and I'm motivated by that. I'm like the bus kids. I am like the bus kids, no doubt. And, uh, and, 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 and <laughs> hallelujah. But thank God he's all in all. Can I say this? He's all in Revelation. He's all in Revelation. He's all in the Bible. You know, this book is the complete revelation. Nothing needs added and nothing needs taken away. Someone was telling Brother Scott about them extra books, right, and all that stuff. We don't need any extra books. We don't need a new revelation. 
We have a complete revelation right here. You know, it's amazing to me. People always look for something new when they haven't even read what's there. Right? I got some new doctrine, some new psalm, some new thing. Have you even read what's there? Thank God this is complete revelation of Jesus Christ. We don't need anything else. I listen to people quote these funny, these funny Bibles. And I said, man, they, that, they, they missed it all together. They missed it all together. You say, why? Because they, hey, most of those new Bibles are not, do not come from the right set of manuscripts. You know, if, if you start with, if, can I tell you this? If you start with a crooked, crooked board, everything you build on will be crooked. And, I, I, and I've learned a lot about that recently. <laughs> Framing the house, right? I mean, you need something that's straight to start with, right? And, and, and you know, and, and thank God, uh, the received text was straight. The Alexandrian text out of Egypt was corrupt. And that's where all new translations come from, with the exception of the Catholic Bible and the Latin Vulgate. And, and thank God we got a complete revelation it is what we need. And, 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 and again, nothing needs to be added to it. it. It's what we need, all we need, and when we need it. Second Peter said this, uh, we, who, it says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein you do well that you take heed unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, we got a sure word of prophecy. You say, what do you do, Brother Chris? When, hey, when I got a problem, I, I, I dive into this book. And I said, this book has the answer for every situation of life. You say, does it? God has revealed all kind of things to me from just reading his word. And every major decision I've made in my life, I have got it from the word of God and from the Holy Ghost speaking to me. Christ is the focus of the Bible. John 5, 39, he said, Search the scripture in them, you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Christ. They say in Washington, D.C., a copy of the Constitution, if you look at it from a, from a certain angle, you can see the impression of George Washington. Well, with the Bible, uh, you can see the image from any viewpoint of Jesus Christ. He's Christ in Genesis, he's Christ in Revelation. All through the Bible, you see Jesus Christ. Why do you think we encourage people to read the Bible? Why do you think Satan tries to get people not to read the Bible? Why do you think the devil gave us counterfeits so we wouldn't have the truth? The last thing that the devil wants you to see is Jesus Christ. And that's why, what's the emphasis today in most churches? It's the music program. And there's so little word. I mean, there's so little Bible being preached. I mean, it wouldn't be enough to, to, to keep anybody alive, spiritually speaking. You know, we got, we got an hour and a half of singing and 10-minute sermon. And, and you say, well, that's a little lopsided. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it's no wonder we're so spiritually weak in this generation. And Christians do every God-forsaken thing you can think of and, and call it Christian. And you say, well, you know, what has happened? You know, they've gotten away from the all in all, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the focus of the Bible. Thank God that he is. Uh, he's the fulfillment, Christ, the fulfillment of the Bible, the promised seed of Genesis, the Passover lamb of Exodus, the high priest of Leviticus, the serpent on the pole in Numbers, the great prophet of Deuteronomy, all the way to the potentate uh, and king of kings coming in the book of Revelation. And no matter where you slice it, you will find Jesus Christ in the Bible. And that's why this book is a hated book. You get killed for having this book a lot of places in the world. And you say, why? Because it's so powerful. The word of God is quick and powerful. Sharpening to edged sword, piercing and dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, most Christians don't memorize scripture anymore. You know why? Because they get a new Bible every year. A new translation, an updated one, this, that, and the other thing. And they don't know what the Bible says. I've never seen someone who uses a, another translation could, could, could quote 100 verses in the Bible. They can paraphrase 100 verses in the Bible. They sure can't quote them. You say, why? Because, hey, the devil doesn't want you to know the word of God. Because it's quick and powerful, and it changes your life. Thank God. He's the all in Revelation. We're going to move quickly tonight. Can I say this? Not only is he the all in Revelation, 
but he's the all in creation. Amen. Thank God that he is. The book of Colossians 1 and verse number 16. Thank God he's the all in creation. Would to God our work nation get a hold of this. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and visible. Whether there be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things are created by him and before him. And he's before all things and by him all things consist. If God went to sleep for two seconds, the world would be over. What holds it all together? God holds it all together. If one of them comets adjusted its trajectory just by a minute degree, there would be no earth. I mean, God's holding it all together. If gravity changed, life would be unsustainable on earth. We'd either uh, burn up or freeze to death. Uh, It's God that's keeping it all together. That's why it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same as the beginning with God, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything that that was made. Hey, Jesus made it all, and He's holding it all together. Thank God that He is. Christ's fingerprints are on everything, the earth, the sea, the water, the plants, the animals, the I mean, hallelujah, and us, DNA. I mean, we were made after the likeness image of God. Amen. You can't get away from that. And, you know, I, I always laugh these evolutionists. 23 and Me uh, debunked evolution completely. Because your 23 uh, chromosomes don't match those of animals. Hallelujah. Thank God. And if, and if your does, then that means your relatives live at the zoo. Hallelujah. And, and, I, and I ain't seen nobody, hey, my, my DNA didn't take me to the zoo. Hallelujah. It took me all the way back to Adam. And science has proved that. They proved that every man has got, every man and woman came from two people. It hair lipped science to say that. And it wasn't some monkey hanging out of a tree, glory to God. Everything God made shows the trinity of God. There's three parts to everything. The earth has three parts, crest, mantle, and core. Water, ice, liquid, and steam. Uh, the, uh, uh, the atmosphere, three layers. The plants, branch, trunk, roots. Animals, head, torso, limbs, and us, so. And man, body, soul, and spirit. Everything is made after the likeness and image of God. We could go on and on about that. Oh, I say this all the time. Only a fool would believe the myth of evolution. Dr. Lakin said this. I have no confidence in biology. Bam, ba- baboon boosters who pray our father who art thou in the coconut tree <laughs> or the ones that say uh, once I was a tadpole long and thin then I was a bullfrog with my tail tucked in then I was a monkey hanging from a tree now I'm a fresher with a PhD <laughs> hallelujah I love making fun of evolutionists how anybody could swallow that I, I mean when I was a lost sinner going to hell I couldn't believe that I used to joke, my brother Joe, he had the brawn and I had the brains. Joe believed in evolution. I said, I can't believe you believe in evolution. Let me tell you right now, I didn't fall out of a tree. Right? I didn't come from no one cell of me, but hallelujah. I came from Adam and Eve. And I just could never believe that lie, even as a sinner going to hell. I did go to school for 12 years, and their science was always changing. They taught us with authority in ninth grade that the new ice age was coming and by the, world, by the year 2000, uh, the world wouldn't exist anymore because we'd be freezing to death. Man, how that changed, the global warming, right? And I said, this, this is a lie. This is a lie. That can't be true. Now, you remember in 1980, the freezer bowl, the Bengals played the San Francisco 49ers. They said the urinals at, the, at Bengal Stadium, actually, the urine froze in the urinals. It was that cold in Cincinnati. I got my little uh, escort. It was brand new. Went out there. No one's cart would start, but my escort started. Went to church. Me and Brother Vic were there, and there was no one else. Brother Bill came down. I said, I, he said, I knew you two nuts would be here. No one else could come to church. No one's car would start. It was 20 below zero. The world's coming to an end. The ice age is here. Yeah, and man came from a monkey too, right? It's not science if it's always changing. And yet it does. Evolution is a hoax of the devil to fool man into hell. And he's done a good job. And it's sad. Romans 5.12 says, By one one man... uh, 
By one man sin came into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, and that all have sinned. Thank God. It was, it was Adam and Eve, and God made them. You think about that. I could get into the first and second laws of thermodynamics, energy conversa- uh, uh, com- uh, conservation, energy decay, but there's no point in it. It's math. That's how we know the Bible's true. The odds of probability. Can I say this? He's all in salvation. Thank God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Aren't you glad? He made it simple. There's not a thousand ways to get to heaven. There's one way to get to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ. There's one God and one meter between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Thank God that it is. George W. Truett told about a man who lived in a cheap hotel room in Texas. After spending his fortune, his whole fortune seeking peace and not finding it, Dr. Truett said, I think he found the peace he was looking for. When they found his body, he was, uh, there was a, on a table nearby, there was a sheet of paper with this poem that he penned down. He said, I've searched in vain a thousand ways, my fears to quell, my hopes to raise. All I need, the Bible says, is Jesus. Don't you know he came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? If everyone could figure that out, life would be so different. A fellow went to his pastor and asked, what can I do to get, the, get saved? The preacher replied, well, you have to have 100 points to go to heaven. You know, the guy's pretty smart. And he says, well, he says, I don't know if I have any points or not. He says, well, tell me what you've done. He said, uh, and I'll tell you if you got any points. And he said, well, I keep the Ten Commandments. He said, okay, that's worth five points. <laughs> five points. He said, why well, join the church and baptize? He said, okay, that's another five points. You're still missing 90, right? He said, well, I've been faithful to my wife and been a good father. He said, that's five more points. That total is 15 points. Well, I give a tithe of my income. He said, that's five more, 20 points. He said, I pray every day and read my Bible. That's five more points. When the fellow ran out of good things to say that he had done, he he said, I only have 35 points. The pastor asked, is there anything else you have done to which you could get more points? The man answered, I can't think of another thing. He said, yes, I did one other thing. One night in a country church, I heard a preacher tell how Jesus Christ loved sinners and how he bore our sins, his own body on the cross. And he preached that night that Jesus died and suffered uh, uh, hell and paid our debt at Calvary. And when he gave the invitation, I went forward and trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. The pastor said, that's 100 points. You see, it's not all those other things. It's believing in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the all He is the all, hallelujah, in our salvation. Amen. Can I say this? He's the all in the congregation. That's the church. You say, what's the church all about? The focus of the church is Christ. It's not the preacher. It's not the the, the preachers, the pastors, the deacon, the trustees. It's not the Sunday school classes. No, no. The focus is Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church, the founder of the church, the first one from the dead in the church. It's all about him. Thank God. We have two church church ordinances. That is the Lord's Supper, communion. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. You say, what's it about? It's about his death on Calvary, the soup coming king. Without Christ, it would be meaningless. We're observing the Lord's Supper on Christmas Day. We do it four times a year here. You say, why? Because it's all about Christ. The second one is baptism. Matthew 28, we're commanded, he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, uh, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you all, even in the world. You say, what's it about? Baptism is not about, the, uh, it's not about uh, his, his death, but it, it's about his resurrection. The Bible said, when we, we baptize some, we say, Bury with him in, in baptism, and in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the newness of life. You see, it's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jack Hiles would say, preach about Christ every sermon if you want revival. What's the focus here? It's not politics. You're not going to hear me preach about politics. I may mention something about politics, but God forbid we could, hey, that's never going to be the, the sermon. I'm never going to preach against City Hall in East Ridge. I'm never going to get up and preach uh, uh, about the economy, the economy, the economy. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter what the economy is. If you don't have Christ, you have nothing. Every message is going to be about Jesus Christ. And 
You know, I'm not going to get up and preach him, you know, about how great I am. <laughs> no, how great he is. Amen. You see, it, it's all about him and the congregation, the church. The reason we even know each other is because of Jesus Christ. Would we even know each other if it wasn't for Jesus? Brother Charlie, if you weren't coming here, I wouldn't even met your family. Right? Because I didn't know them before you start coming to church here. Right? So what's the, what's the whole point of church? Hey, it, it's, it's, it's the all in all of Jesus Christ. And when we come together, it's on the basis and fellowship of Jesus Christ. And that means you can come to church and I don't even got to like you and we can still have fellowship. Right? And you don't even got to like me. Because it's all about Jesus, hallelujah. And he's the thing that makes us cohesive. You know? And, and thank God, uh, he's the all in the congregation. Can I say this? He's all in our expectation. Our expectation. He said, what's your expectation? Looking unto Jesus, uh, the author and finish for our faith. That's who we're looking for. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What are you looking for? Every day I'm looking for Jesus. Amen. I'm looking for him. It's all about him. He's all my hope. All my hope is in Christ Jesus. I'd hate for my hope to be in the stock market. Remember, what goes up must come down. Well, my hope's in my house. Yeah, until it crashes. And all of a sudden it was worth 450 and now it's worth 50000 If you didn't learn that in 2008, you didn't learn anything. Right? Now, you know what you want to do. You want to buy low and sell high. <laughs> you know what most people do? They buy high and sell low. And they're in financial ruin. But see, our confidence isn't in uncertain riches. You know, all money has wings for a reason. Because it's going to fly away and leave you with nothing. Rudy Giuliani, he got that, that, that judgment against him for $159 million or something like that. And they said he'll be financially ruined. What goes up must come down. Hallelujah. Uncertain riches. It's amazing how that is. It's why people during the Great Depression jumped off of buildings. It's why during the Great Recession, they jumped off of buildings. They killed themselves. They couldn't live with the thought, oh, I'm going to be broke. Hey, if they'd have stayed around a little while, it came back up. Right? Because it's higher now than it's ever been. You know? There's always winners and losers in economic turndowns. You know? Save up your money. There's going to be one soon. <laughs> Go buy all that property cheap and sell it high. You know, the Bible said the children of this world are wiser than the children of the kingdom. And that's such a sad thing. You know, Psalms 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You think about that. Among the last words of John Wesley were, Best of all, Christ is with us. A.J. Gordon's dying words were, Victory, victory. Billy Bray's dying words were, Glory, glory, I'll soon be with the Lord. Glory be to God, and off we went to heaven. D.L. Moody's dying words were, this is my coronation day. It's a day I've been looking forward for, to for years. Hey, Christians have something to look forward to. Something to look forward to. Curtis Hudson was young uh, when his uncle John was dying, and he's called uh, uh, to, to play the accordion at his bedside. And, and it says he, he, he played and sang in the great homecoming week. And laid down the old uh, accordion down. And he says, and Uncle John began to smile. And he said, do you see him? He said, I got cold chills. And said, no, I don't see him. He said, they're all around here. The room is full of them. Uh, they're out there in the yard. Of course, Curtis Hudson said, those old walls hadn't been painted for years. The paint was peeling off. And it looked over at the walls and said, aren't those beautiful walls? I said, if you say so, John. He said, they're the most beautiful things I ever saw. And he said, look at all those beautiful flowers. Of course, there wasn't a flower in the room. Uncle John was that close to heaven. Amen. Jesus Christ is all in death, after death, the resurrection, because Jesus is coming, and the dead are going to be raised. Amen. You see, he's our all. Amen. He's our all. You know, when I'm laying on my deathbed, I want to see them roses. Yeah. Man, I want to see, I want to see them angels. I want to hear that heavenly chorus, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm getting Holy Ghost chill bumps talking about it. I've been at the bedside of dying Christians, and it's real. 
Thank God is all it is. The last thing is this. He's our all in glorification. You know, you think about in the Revelation, the theme is Christ and Him glorified. You know, they sing that song, they answer, He's worthy, He is worthy. He's worthy of all the praise. He's worthy of power. He's worthy of the, of the premise. Praise to the Lamb that was slain. An old lady was dying and she said, uh, bring. That was all she could say. So she was so weak they brought in a picture album. No, no, no. She didn't want that. She gained a little strength again said, bring. And they brought in children one by one. And no, no, no. They brought in her a, a, a glass of water. No, no, no again. And, and, and she said, Bring. And they brought a washcloth and, and bathed her lips. They brought everything they could to think of, but she could not finish the sentence. She could only say, bring. And just before she died, she gained enough strength to sit up in the bed and said, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. And she went to heaven. I'm glad he's my all in revelation, creation, salvation, the congregation, expectation, glorification. And thank God tonight, he's my all in supplication. You know, I find him in prayer, in sweet communion. I, I, I let him bring cleansing and renewal to my life. And you know what? He's the only one who can. I was praying this morning, and I found him in my prayer closet. And I found that he was my all in all. I found him last night before I went to bed. And I found him that he was my all in all. Is he the all in all in your life? And if not, why not? Colossians 4.2 says, continue in prayer and watch them the same with thanksgiving. You know, he's everything. He's everything. And what did he say there in Ephesians 1, 23? He said, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. I feel sorry for you if Jesus isn't your everything. Because if you don't have that relationship with him, something's always going to be missing But when you're full in Jesus Christ, you are a very satisfied customer. And I can tell you right now, I am satisfied in Jesus. Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Miss Susan's coming. Miss Linda, they're going to play a little something tonight. Hallelujah. Give you a chance. If you want to come pray, you can come pray.